This is the Nutrition During Lactation module. This is the last part, part four, and we had just finished talking about colic, and now we will be moving on to um, cultural avoidance. While most mothers eat a wide variety of food, there are many cultures around the planet that have specific foods they avoid for a number of reasons. Some cultures embrace certain foods that are shunned by others. Some foods that are avoided may be high in fiber, acidic fruits, gas-forming vegetables and beans, uh, milk, certain spices, and sometimes even chocolate. Some mothers believe that certain foods affect her baby negatively, and it's fine to restrict or omit a certain food for you know a certain period of time, and they can usually be resumed when culturally it's appropriate for them. Again, we're talking about you know very specific foods, not eliminating entire food groups. Usually, uh, these foods can be offered to baby at later time without any issues. Again, all food is really generally fine for the mom to eat. If a mom feels strongly about a certain food, again, that's okay. They just need to ensure that she's receiving a balanced diet. Studies demonstrate that children have increased acceptance of foods later in life when eaten by their lactating moms. And this, this also comes into play when we're looking at issues um, like alcohol. The flavor of foods and drinks do seep into breast milk, and studies have found that breastfed infants breastfeed longer when moms have diets high in garlic or vanilla. So it's just kind of a fun fact to keep in mind. New moms everywhere are in search of natural ways to boost milk supply. Current trends in maternal health, such as the increasing rates of obesity, delayed age at childbearing, and the high rates of C-sections um, are all considerations, and these all lead to delayed lactogenesis. Women who are not enjoying um, breastfeeding success may seek out ways to induce lactation or may seek out ways to increase the quantity of her breast milk, and they may turn to galactagogues or other lactogenic foods. And a galactagog is an herb that is thought to help increase breast milk production in nursing moms. Every culture has them. There are no studies to indicate that they're effective. And we've mentioned before that many moms will, in the interest in pursuing optimal nutrition, try many, many things. And some things they try are good and some things that you know they try are not good. So many herbs and supplements are in fact unsafe or they may mask the symptoms of a legitimate condition or illness. There are two herbs that are commonly thought to be lactogenic. Some women may find these helpful and some may not. And keep in mind that there's something called the placebo effect. The placebo effect is a beneficial effect produced by a placebo drug or treatment that can't be attributed to the properties of the placebo itself and therefore must be due to the patient's belief in that treatment. So clinically, it you know the drug or the treatment or the herb doesn't really have any way to fix what's going on but just the pure belief in the ability of that um, you know constituent to improve lactation or improve the quantity of lactation is in itself enough to boost milk supply again most cases of insufficient milk supply are due to insufficient or ineffective breastfeeding for example, fenugreek is believed to raise maternal prolactin levels. If a mom's prolactin levels are generally normal, fenugreek will not help, nor will any other medication help. If a mom's prolactin levels are normal, they're normal. Moringa is in the same category. Again, moms should really be encouraged and counseling really does need to address effective breastfeeding practices. So your text does list www.lowmilksupply.org as a reliable source to determine whether or not a galactagogue may be appropriate. Again, mom should always inform you know, their physician as well as the baby's physician about what they're taking. Same thing here. Any herbs, teas, or home remedies should be discussed with a healthcare provider. As mentioned earlier, some can be toxic and unsafe. Let's look at low carbohydrate diets. So low carbohydrate diets are very, very popular. Now a healthy low carbohydrate diet can be compatible with breastfeeding, but there are a few things to consider. Keep in mind, there is no official definition of a low carb diet. Most advise curbing or eliminating some or all grains, fruits, legumes, and vegetables. 
many people, especially preteens and adolescents, may be particularly interested in trying carbohydrate-restricting diets due to the appeal of promised weight loss. Personally, I am wary of any diet, any diet that eliminates or overemphasizes one macronutrient or food groups. Again, experts recommend a little more than about half of the calories consumed should come from carbohydrates. There are many nutritious foods, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, non-fat milk products, lean milk products um, contain carbohydrates, which are the body's preferred energy source. Carbohydrates are also found in foods such as sugary beverages, candy, and baked goods. They're also found in overly processed foods. Now limiting those types of carbohydrate containing foods is beneficial, and that may indeed lead to weight loss. Again, parents are role models, and while they may function fine with a low-carbohydrate diet, children and teenagers do need carbohydrates from whole grains, fresh fruits, and dairy. Their intake of these food groups is vital to their growth and development, and restricting these foods can make children and teenagers feel sluggish or cranky. Decreasing healthy carbohydrates, popular in some trendy current diet models, That doesn't leave much to eat, and it really eliminates a vast number of micronutrients that are critical to health and wellness. Eating fewer carbohydrates may produce weight loss, but including certain carbohydrate-containing foods actually helps promote a healthy weight. We've talked about whole grains. Whole grains like brown rice, well, those are digested more slowly than refined grains like white rice, and those will actually prevent hunger because it just takes longer for them to be digested. Fiber, calcium, and vitamin D, those are three important nutrients that many children and teens lack, and those are found in carbohydrate-rich foods. Instead of avoiding all carbohydrate-containing foods, it's better for children and adults to get into the habit of eating healthier choices, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and non-fat or lean dairy. Returning to their pre-pregnancy weight is a common interest among postpartum women. Many women feel societal pressure enforced by images of postpartum celebrities who appear to return to their former figures swiftly and effortlessly to lose weight and get back into shape quickly after giving birth. With a healthy diet and exercise, much of the weight that women gain during pregnancy will be shed naturally during the first year postpartum. The goal should be gradual weight loss. For all but these women with high or very high pre-pregnancy weights, the recommended weight loss after the first month postpartum is around 4.5 pounds a month or maybe a little bit more. Caloric intake should not fall below 1,800 calories a day, and this figure may need to be revised upward on the basis of such consideration of um, you know, breastfeeding multiples or nutritional status or length of activity. Inadequate caloric intake may increase postpartum fatigue and may have a negative impact on mood. Many women are faced with extra weight after the pregnancy is over. 15 to 20 percent retain five or more kilograms or around 11 pounds of gestational weight gain, increasing the risk of cumulative weight gain and the resulting health risks. Eating more calories than are burned results in weight gain. Eating less calories than are burned results in weight loss. Shifting from high calorie foods to low calorie foods will help with postpartum weight loss. An example would be choosing water over soda or non-fat dairy over low fat dairy. The dietary guidelines can be very helpful when crafting recommendations. Women who are severely restricting their diet due to um, a focus on you know, weight should consider a supplement. Weight loss should not be promoted as a benefit of breastfeeding. Often, instructing lactating women to focus on nutritional foods and exercise and to eat to satisfy their hunger will result in the desired slow pattern of weight loss. Again, around a half a pound to two pounds a week or you know, 4.5 pounds or a little bit more um, over the course of a month. That's generally um, the acceptable way to go. Again, the best way to lower calories is to limit the calories from added sugars and saturated fats. Uh, Again, those are found in foods like soft drinks and desserts, fried foods, cheese, whole milk, and fatty meats. Um, Choosing foods that are low-fat or non-fat or fat-free. Choosing whole grains or, again, going back to the tried-and-true-myplate.gov campaign of keeping half of a plate fresh fruits or vegetables is really the ideal weight maintenance program. 
And again, the entire family will benefit from these choices. If weight loss is happening too quickly and more calories are needed, again, eating a little more from each food group or adding an additional snack should do the trick, not necessarily uh, choosing foods that are, you know, the whole foods, the fried foods. You don't want to go back and choose foods that are less nutritious. You just want to eat a little bit more of the nutritious foods. And if a mom comes to you with an extreme diet, like a liquid diet, or again, diets that eliminate entire food groups, those diets should be avoided. But again, that's my recommendation, no matter what stage of life a mom is in, not necessarily because she's breastfeeding. Now, when you look at postpartum weight loss, exercise is key. And exercise should be an ongoing part of any lifestyle. When it comes to postpartum weight loss, there are really two considerations, exercise and healthy eating patterns. In the module, Basic Nutrition and Nutrition Education, we went over the dietary guidelines in detail, but we'll cover them briefly in this module as well. The bottom line for weight loss, you wanna limit calories from added sugars and saturated fats, and you wanna make half of your plate fruits and vegetables. Looking specifically at exercise, unless a healthcare provider identifies a medical reason that precludes physical activity, breastfeeding women can be encouraged to participate in at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week, ideally spread throughout the week. They can do 22 to 30 minutes of moderately intense exercise on most days. Exercise isn't just important for weight loss, but it's also important physically and emotionally. Exercise does help with stress reduction, and even when parents live in places where it's difficult to be outside, there are a number of ways to be active inside. Strenuous exercise of greater than one hour a day may require additional calories to support lactation, and again, breast refusal due to lactic acid buildup has been refuted by recent studies. A mom is concerned about her babies reacting to her, the mom's intake of milk. She isn't allergic to milk. What suggestions would you offer? Well, all foods can be enjoyed. If the infant shows a reaction, then you can start to eliminate foods, beginning with milk, wheat, nuts, eggs, etc. It may take up to 21 days for the offending food to leave the system completely, but if the infant benefits from the removal of the food, that's okay. If there's no difference, a slow reintroduction is fine. What are the recommendations for postpartum exercising? Moms should exercise at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity workouts. It can be four to six times a week, anywhere from, you know, 22 to 30 minutes for each session. And they should begin six to eight weeks postpartum with the release from a doctor. Many women are faced with extra weight once the pregnancy is over. What is the recommended amount of weight loss per week? So the recommended weight loss per week is around a half a pound to two pounds a week. Eating disorders are a group of conditions marked by an unhealthy relationship with food. The three main types are anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorders. Eating disorders are a serious medical problem that can have long-term health consequences if left untreated. Eating disorders in children and teens can lead to a host of serious physical problems and even death and breast milk quality may be a concern for certain anorexic individuals, specifically in regards to the quantity of water-soluble vitamins, lactose, and fat. There's little data on bulimic individuals. If you suspect or recognize that one of your clients has an eating disorder, it's imperative that she uh, seek competent medical help. Even among nutrition professionals, eating disorders are a specialty, and um, they're treated with a team of specialists. Many RDNs do not specialize in this area, but they will refer to ones that do. Eating disorders are less of a nutrition issue than an emotional or physical one. When moms are breastfeeding multiples, they should avoid doubling their nutrient intake. While people do want to avoid excessive weight loss or gain, it is unnecessary and unwise to recommend doubling of anything, be it supplements or other nutrients. The mom should be encouraged to uh, follow you know, meaningful eating patterns and to let her hunger be her guide. Fluid intake may actually be more important in these cases, and while drinking more may not help with milk production, 
they do need to ensure that they meet the recommended amount daily. So I did mention this during um, the pregnancy during nutrition module, but I did want to reemphasize again that around half of the pregnancies in the United States are unplanned, um, and often women who are breastfeeding one little one can find themselves pregnant with another. And while nutrient needs are increased during the second and third trimesters, um, again, the same thing with breastfeeding multiples. You don't need to double supplements. That's just not indicated. You know, moms should be cautioned that sometimes spontaneous weaning occurs and, you know, they do need to be prepared that at times, a, you know, an older baby or a toddler who is breastfeeding may start uh, rejecting the breast. Again, they do need to check in with their healthcare provider and let them know that they are, you know, breastfeeding during their pregnancy. So factors such as frequency of breastfeeding, age, and the health and condition of the mom and the baby um, should be considered when it comes to breastfeeding during pregnancy. But again, if a mom is healthy and if she's eating well and all things considered are fine, again, she just follows the regular healthy eating plan, maybe bumping her calories up a little bit in this situation. So tandem nursing follows the same guidelines. When a woman nurses two children of different ages, it's called tandem nursing, and producing milk for two children does require more calories and nutrients than needed to feed one, just again like breastfeeding multiples. An additional 500 calories a day should be sufficient to meet the demands of extra milk production. High calorie and high nutrient foods and snacks and meals do provide good sources of additional calorie intake. And again here, what moms need to look at is not necessarily um, increasing any, you know, any food, but making sure that the foods that she is increasing are nutrient dense. So foods like, you know, avocados or nuts, nut butters, seeds, seed butters, dried fruits, full fat soy products, bean spreads, and, you know, foods with omega-3 um, fatty acids. Those are all really good selections that will provide additional calories, but also provide additional natural nutrition. Making sure that women are hydrated is also a factor. And again, it's just letting thirst be her guide, making sure that she is, you know, considering having an, you know, a glass of water, you know, at every meal or snack. And again, making sure that she does, you know, check her, you know, urination. Is her urine clear or mostly clear throughout the day? Due to high mercury levels, what foods should be avoided during pregnancy, lactation, and early childhood? So foods to be avoided are king mackerel, marlin, orange roughy, shark, swordfish, tilefish, and big eye tuna. What nutrition recommendations would you give a mom who is tandem breastfeeding? So high calorie and nutrient dense foods and snacks and meals provide good sources of additional calorie intake. Again, you don't want to go for high fat choices or added sugars. It's the nutrient dense, healthy foods like avocado, nuts and nut butters, seeds and seed butters, dried fruits, full fat soy products, bean spreads, and omega-3 fatty acid sources. And again, making sure mom is hydrated is really important. So healthy food choices during lactation is important for mom and baby. And again, practical and specific food suggestions are important. Working with pregnant moms to determine specific and practical nutrition goals and helping them understand the whys behind dietary suggestions is key. And this actually helps moms be more compliant. You can provide the most spot on helpful recommendations, but if they're not practiced, it doesn't matter. Helping families understand that healthy eating is compatible with limited budgets is also really important. Healthy eating patterns offering a strong pathway to positive lactation outcomes can include special diets like vegetarianism. Empowering women to eat well and provide good nutrition for their families is important to future generational well-being. We talked about all of these in length during the nutrition during pregnancy module, but I just want to re-emphasize the fact that there are many factors that affect diet. Dietary background, health, family situations, housing, culture, income, and dietary practices all affect a mom's food choices. Again, 
items like time, priority, cravings, money, availability, culture, emotional comfort, location, and nutrition all come into play when we're looking at a mom's nutritional status. In the pregnancy during nutrition module, we had you plan out a 2400 calorie diet. And while that was helpful, I hope, again, that was basically food choices. That wasn't taking into consideration a mom's time or what her priorities may be, what her cravings are, what money is available, what food is available, what her cultural influences might be, what foods provide her with some emotional comfort. Is there availability of fresh produce and what are the nutritional components that she may be looking at these are all factors that need to be woven in when planning someone's diet so suggestions that are specific and measurable have a higher chance of success and suggesting that women you know drink less caffeine um, that's not as meaningful as you know what try swapping out your soda for flavored sparkling water at least three times a week or asking what do you think you can do in order to um, you know swap out your soda or or asking instead of soda what are things that you think you could try We know that diet and health are deeply connected. Only tobacco and alcohol intake influence health more. Of the leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes, four are related to diet. Again, other factors are important, genetics, activity level, but there are a number of diseases and conditions that are influenced and possibly preventable with healthy eating patterns. It's a spectrum. Some conditions are completely hereditary and some are completely nutrition related, but there are many, many others in the middle of the spectrum that are influenced by both to a different degree. So when we look at the effect of maternal food intake on lactation, this is a statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics. The only two contraindications to breastfeeding are the following. Infants with clactic galactosemia and mothers in the United States who are infected with HIV. Breastfeeding is not contraindicated with the following conditions bacteriemia, diarrhea, a respiratory tract infection, necrotizing intercolitis, otitis media, a urinary tract infection, late onset sepsis in preterm infants, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, lymphoma, leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, and childhood weight and obesity. There are maternal health benefits to breastfeeding, such as decreased postpartum bleeding and more rapid uterine in involution, decreased menstrual blood loss and increased child spacing, earlier return to pre-pregnancy weight, and decreased risk of breast and ovarian cancers. Breastfeeding is also a great environmental benefit. It's also a great benefit to society. Breastfeeding families are sick less often, and the parents miss less work. It doesn't require the use of energy for manufacturing, or it doesn't create waste or um, air pollution. There's also no risk of contamination, and it's always the right temperature, and it's always ready to feed. And yet, formula feeding in our country and around the globe remains the norm. So when we look at the effect of maternal food intake on breastfeeding, increasing maternal energy and, and fluid does not influence milk volume unless significant maternal malnourishment exists. Stress is more likely to be a factor in terms of, in terms of quantity of breastfeeding than all others. Remember, culture can play a large role in lactation, and some cultural traditions limit the mother's foods for a few weeks. Most cultures do not have such restrictions. You need to ascertain the power that that culture has in each specific family. In some families, cultural traditions may be discarded, and in others, you will need to find a workaround and solve the issue within that cultural practice. So caffeine also passes to the infant through breast milk, Infants do not have the capacity to metabolize this stimulant well, and they may be fussy or alert. Now, generally, a daily cup of coffee or a tea or soda will be fine, and most infants can handle those. Again, water is always the preferred beverage, and a woman's thirst can generally be her guide. And again, with the exception of the first morning ur urination, if urine is pale yellow or clear, that should indicate adequate hydration. Caffeine content varies wildly, and moms really do uh, need to investigate how much caffeine they're actually taking. And usually we say a cup of coffee a day is fine, but a cup of coffee would be, you know, a five ounce coffee cup. And for most people, five ounces is, is very, very small. Most people ingest much more than simply five ounces of coffee. And again, one five ounce cup of coffee may have 200 milligrams, while another one may have, you know, 450 milligrams. 
coffee does have the most caffeine, uh, but also, you know, there are energy drinks, soda, and black and green teas. Chocolate also has caffeine, but again, in much smaller amounts, and even some medications have caffeine. Herbal teas can be an option as they're generally caffeine free and harmless to the infant, but there are herbs that should be avoided. And these include chaparral, comfrey, germander, pennyroyal, and blue cohosh, as those are detrimental to an infant. Herbs aren't regulated by the FDA and often the origin and conditions of growth of herbs are unknown. And they also may be contaminated by alcohol or opiates. Now, artificial sweeteners can be used. There's generally no restrictions on these if they're used moderately. Again, there's really no hard evidence that they prevent overweight or obesity, but individually they can be used as a tool to cut back on, um, on sugar. Phenylalanine, known as PKU, is an inherited disorder that increases the levels of a substance called phenylalanine in the blood. And phenylalanine is a building block of proteins. It's an amino acid that's obtained through the diet. And it's found in all proteins and in some artificial sweeteners. In this case, aspartame should be avoided. It breaks down into phenylalanine, and phenylalanine builds up and can cause developmental delay. Products containing these amino acids carry a warning label. And in this situation, moms are generally uh, seeing a registered dietitian nutritionist in order to um, you know, build a specific diet plan. Teens may have diets that are low in iron, calcium, and other nutrients, either because of poor intake, uh, because they follow the typical American diet, or they may have socioeconomic or family issues. So teens often skip meals, especially breakfast, and they often have a typical teen diet of inadequate vegetable and fruit intake. Even teens living above the poverty level still really don't consume the recommended amount of fruits or vegetables. And this is a priority, especially for those teens that are less than four years from the onset of menstruation. Young teens do need to account for their own growth needs. They also need to account for those of their baby. Teens should be encouraged to breastfeed for all of the physiological and emotional benefits that breastfeeding has to offer for her and the baby. A healthy diet becomes even more important for mom and baby for a successful outcome for both. And the specific nutrients that teens need to look out for are low iron, low folic acid, and low calcium. A breastfeeding mom is worried about drinking too much coffee. What would you tell her? A daily cup of coffee, tea, or soda will be fine for most infants to handle. Water is always the preferred beverage, and you should watch the infant for signs of fussiness, irritability, and difficulty sleeping. What are special considerations to look out for when counseling a teen mom? Well, the teen may still be growing. She has a higher risk of nutrient deficiencies like low iron, low folic acid, and low calcium, and she has a higher risk of lack of nutrition knowledge and low vegetable and fruit intake. We are what we eat, and we are what our mother and her mother and her mother ate as well. In the slides following, I've included a number of quality, reliable resources for you to refer to. In the age of Google, it's very easy for people to amass an immense amount of information and not all of it is quality. So it really is important for you to maintain a reliable library of sources that you can go to. And again, thank you.